so you're just a few, about a week away from inauguration, starting 2015. Yeah. Do you have any goals, resolutions as you start the year? Well, the biggest thing for this year and for the term is we want to help more people live the American dream. I mean, I think for a lot of folks, uh, you know, it's as simple as owning your own home, having your own job. For some people, starting their own small business. I think for most of us, particularly for those of us with kids, it's, it's ensuring that our, our children and someday our grandchildren will have a, a better life or at least as good of a life as we've had here in the state of Wisconsin, our own communities. And my goal is to make sure that everyone, no matter where they live, no matter what zip code they're from, is able to live their piece of the American dream right here in this state. So that presumably is going to start with the budget, which mm -hmm. you've been tweeting, you're working on just about yeah. every day. Yeah. What can you tell us? Can you tell us any specifics about what are going to be, what's going to be in this? Well, it'll be a tight budget in large part because just cost to continue for Medicaid is over $700 million because of the way the federal government hands that money out we're pretty much our hands are tied to almost all of it. There's only a few little tweaks we can make because of what they call cost to continue or maintenance of effort, I should say, in terms of cost to continue. So unless we take people off, which is, I'm not willing to take off big swipes of people off of Medicaid, um, it's going to be challenging for us. We're going to have to make it up in other areas. Certainly some of it will come from revenue growth, but uh, other areas will really no one area. Unlike four years ago, it won't just come through local aids with the return of, of the benefits from Act 10. It'll come across the board, but we will still make a commitment to make sure we keep property taxes lower uh, because we know for working families, for senior citizens, for small business owners, and even family farmers, that's really important going forward. Not likely to be huge income tax cuts. That's really pretty much going to be focused on property tax relief. And then we're going to find ways to do more with less. There'll be a number of state agencies that will consolidate and merge, not just for the savings, but really in the larger sense, because I'm trying to make it more efficient, more effective, more accountable to the taxpayers in the state to make it more customer service friendly. And um, you know, going forward, there'll be a number of changes really that kind of question the size and the scope of government. So can you talk about what any of those agency consolidations mm -hmm. might be? Yeah, we'll come out even before the budget comes out. We'll come out mid-January with a, a series of legislative proposals because what we learned from four years ago with the WDC is that you don't want to wait till the budget. You want to do it sooner, and you want to have a lengthier uh, portion of transition. So these are things probably that won't start July 1st in the fiscal year. They'll probably start at the beginning of the next calendar year, so we have enough time for transition. But it's areas like the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation and the Wisconsin Housing Economic Development Authority, WIDA and WDC having similar but not identical responsibilities, saying would it make sense to merge uh, or at least merge their economic development efforts. You look at other state agencies, the Department of Safety and Professional Services has responsibility for the licensing of a lot of professionals in the state but so does entities like the Department of Financial Institutions, so DFI and Safety and Professional Services. There might be some synergies there. There's some other state agencies in terms of Department of Administration looking at some of the work that they do for back offices, HR, IT, to us are all things we should look at. Is it makes sense to keep many of those out in larger state departments, or should we bring that in centralized and, and improve the services as well as reduce some of the costs? Those are all things that we're very much looking at. And like I say, if, if we did them, we would do them early in the legislative session so that we had appropriate amount of time for transition. What about the transportation budget? Mm -hmm. The DOT proposal rolled out. It included gas tax increase, some other fee increases. You floated an idea about yeah. a sales tax on gas. Where, where does that stand? What do you plan to do? Well, we're looking at a whole number of options because it's not only are there huge transportation needs, so many of those needs are tied into economic prosperity. That the, For a state that's so dependent on manufacturing and agriculture and tourism, all those things need a robust transportation system to get product to and from market and to get people into the state. Uh, but we're going to look at ways of, of looking at that total dollar amount that the Department of Transportation is looking to plug. Is that the right amount? Is that too high? Are there other ways that we could achieve some of those goals? Do all these projects need to be done in this uh, during this next two years uh, time frame, or can we defer any of that? Can we do them more cost effectively? And then, you know, I, I like a lot of lawmakers I've talked to. In fact, uh, two weeks ago, I sat down with just about every member of the new majority in the assembly, <coughs> excuse me, in the assembly and in the Senate, and a good number of the folks talking to me said. They really did not have an appetite uh, for a gas tax increase. Obviously, I have some concerns there as well, but I also want to balance it off with some very legitimate transportation needs. Are there viable alternatives? And that's part of what we're working on. Probably won't 
have a conclusion on until later in January. Is there a way that you're leaning though? Are you looking more at that sales tax you talked about back in October? Well, we're looking at different options, but when we talked about it then, gas taxes were pretty high. I mean, gas prices, excuse me, were very high. Now they're so low, it's, it's actually, if you were gonna do it, it's, and I don't have a real um, affinity towards a gas tax increase, but actually with the prices as low as they are approaching $2, you actually be better off with a gas tax uh, increase as opposed to sales tax because your sales numbers are, are down so much that it wouldn't get you as much. Six months ago, it was just the other way around. Um, the gas tax was not very viable because the vehicle miles traveled was less because of, of, of fuel efficiency, but the price was pretty high, so a sales tax would actually make an impact. In, in either case, what we're not trying to do is, is shift to a higher tax burden, but find the most effect, effective, most efficient way to do this long term. You campaign on a two-year tuition freeze for mm -hmm. UW campuses, and four years ago when you were talking about this, you mentioned uh, essentially a four-year guarantee, like you came yeah. in and you yeah. know that. Have you decided, uh, I mean, is there a way that you want to go with with that, or what can you tell us about the UW Well, it's clear that we're going to freeze tuition. That was such a hit. Two years, first time ever in the system's history that we did a two-year freeze. We're going to do it for two more years. <coughs> we found that, you know, the best way to make college more affordable is to make it more affordable. It's not by lowering student loan rates or things like that, much of which is at the federal level. It's literally at the, at the point of purchase, which is tuition. I think going forward, we also want to make sure that there aren't huge shifts over to other fees and services that take the place of tuition because for a working family or for a student in this state, whether it's tuition or a separate fee, it's still, we want to make sure it's priced in a way that's affordable. And looking at the UW system, I, mean, I think there are going to be some things we're going to look at in the future for many, many years. Uh, regents, presidents, even chancellors on the individual campuses have been saying for years, if not decades, that they could do things more efficiently, more effectively, if they were freed of some of the requirements of state government in terms of purchasing, procurement, even compensation and salary issues. All those things are things that we talked about two years ago, legislature pulled back on. We'd like to re-examine <clears throat> re that and uh, potentially even go further than we had before. So is that flexibilities or is that, I mean, Chancellor Cross, um, or I'm sorry, President Cross, President, yeah. um, he has made some changes to UW-Superior about privatizing janitorial services mm -hmm. up there. Is that what should happen? Should we move toward more privatization? Well, I, I think to me flexibility means exactly that. It means doing what uh, the system or individual chancellors see fit. It's not about the state dictating, you've got to do this or you've got to do that. Uh, in some cases, it might even vary by campus. In one part of the state, it might more, make more sense to, uh, to outsource uh, basic services like custodial, custodial services, things in aging. Uh, in other places, it may not. But to me, the greater flexibility we give the UW system, the better off they'll be. You think the legislature has an appetite for that? Well, again, a lot of it depends on how much we save. I mean, I know even years ago when I was at the county level, um, when I was a former county executive, in the legislative branch then, the county board didn't much like the idea of the sheriff running both what was called the House of Corrections and the jail. But in the end, we put a proposal together that saved $3 million. It became pretty difficult for them to raise property taxes by $3 million just to put the power back in their hands away from the sheriff. And I think the same sort of thing is true here is if we put real flexibilities in the hands of the UW system and it saves them money, uh, I think it'd be hard pressed for the legislature to come in and take that, that money away from them. Now, while you s said you're focused on the budget, it's mm -hmm. very likely right to work legislation is going to come up early on mm -hmm. in this next session. Do you feel stuck here with people saying they're going to push for it and you're saying that, that it's a distraction? No, I mean, I think in the end, I, mean, I think it's got a lot of media attention in the last month or so, but I think after the legislature starts, think about it, school accountability, repealing any reference, even in testing the Common Core, any requirement to do at the local level, all these things we talked about in terms of mergers and consolidations of state agencies, doing more to prepare for the next state budget. Then you've got some lawmakers, not me, but talking about a repeal or reform of GAB and other issues out there. I just think there's a lot of things, a lot of issues, of which there's a lot of common agreement uh, amongst Republicans, but not necessarily down to the detail. And I think, even though there's been a lot of talk of late, I think these other issues are likely to pick up steam sooner, just because there's a, a, a more rapid need for us to respond to those and to act on those. 
And, and we'll see. I mean, just because something was hot in the media uh, a month or two back doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be the first thing the legislature is going to act on. But whether it's January <coughs> or whether it's April or May, if it comes to your desk, do you sign it or not? Well, again, I, I don't typically comment on any piece of legislation. I've pointed out why I think it's a distraction because I think we've got our hands full with these other issues. I think there's, uh, um, you know, I certainly from a business standpoint, I talk to employers who say they like the direction the state's headed. They like that things have calmed down since the recall. But those are all the reasons why I've tried to keep us from getting involved in issues that I think would flare that up again. But, you know, we'll have to see where the process takes us. But right now, my hope is they'll pass the things that we've got on our legislative agenda where we generally have agreement on. We want to talk about the, I guess you could call it the elephant in the room, so to speak. And you've said you are, are yet to make a decision, mm -hmm. but about 2016. Sure. Is it, how do you govern in a state where your friends in the legislature who want you to run for president are trying to bring up things that are, would be good for you mm -hmm. and your opponents in the legislature are saying all he's doing is running for president. <laughs> How do you govern in that? What, what's it like to govern in that environment? Well, the, I mean, the nice thing for me, unlike a former governor or unlike someone who's in the House or the Senate, uh, in, in each of those cases, they can kind of abandon their job or, or miss out part of their job. The only way, if I even am, whether it's two years, six years, who knows how many years from now, the only way I'm ever a viable candidate as a sitting governor uh, is if things are going well in the state. So my priority is, has been, will be, uh, or is today and will be into the future, making sure that things run well here in the state of Wisconsin. And not only because that's what I got elected to do, but because politically it's in my best interest. Unlike somebody else who might take off and you know miss a vote or something like that in the Congress or the Senate, I'm going to be judged by what happens here in the state of Wisconsin. And so my focus will continue to be, it's why I'm spending so much time on the budget, it's why I'm spending so much time in the legislative agenda. What I've learned is there's plenty of pundits over the last four years, not just going ahead, but over the last four years I've had plenty of people who speculated about why I was doing things for a recall election or re-elect. The same sorts of things could happen in the next two years. I just do what I think is right. If I'm doing what I think uh, is the right thing to do, and if those things ultimately produce results, I'll be fine. What kind of conversations have you had with your family about it? How could, it, how could it affect them? Oh, in the, in the end, I mean, I, I, there's no way uh, I would ever seriously consider getting in that race unless I felt uh, that Tonette and my sons Matt and Alex were supportive of that. It's, it's something that not just to run, but to be in office. I mean, you can't do unless your family's supportive of it. And I mean supportive, not just go ahead and do it. Uh, they've got to be all in. And so those are the sorts of discussions um, that will be happening, you know, now, probably in the next six months or so. Um, but like I said, for me, unlike most of the other candidates who aren't sitting governors, um, I can't in any way allow any, uh, any of this process, be it even just thinking about it, in any way distract from the work I need to do in the state of Wisconsin. Not only because that's my responsibility, but because politically I take away... The biggest asset I have is if I take my eye off the ball, which is getting things done here. What do they think so far? Well, I think in general, my family, uh, if I chose to do this, I mean, they, you know, one of the weird things about having a recall is, is that they've gone through not just three elections in four years, but two of the last three have been big time. I mean, I don't think, other than someone who's actually run for president before, I don't think particularly in that recall, there's a bigger election in this country uh, in terms of intensity, focus, dollars spent, attention drawn from around the country. I mean, you know, I had donors in all 50 states. I had, you know, even in the small dollars, 70 plus percent of my donations were 75 bucks or less, but I am from all 50 states. I had interest from across the country. I had, as you know, not only in the recall, but in this last election being the number one target of three of the national uh, unions out there, I had just about everything imaginable thrown at me. And so, what normally would scare family and friends, I think because of the recall and because of this last election being the number one target, they're pretty well prepared. We went to Iowa and mm -hmm. we went to Plainfield. Did you actually did a great story. Oh. About that here. Like <laughs> well, I went back and I looked at my old yearbook. I remember Tommy Schreg's uh, uh, father, which was a blast from the past. Uh, I think he said Tom. And I'm thinking we used to call him Tommy. Yeah. That's a long time ago in third grade. What do you think when you see, I mean, folks like that from the past who are saying, man, I sure hope he runs? Well, it's a great story. I mean, it's, it's uh, I have to laugh. Uh, um, the, 
I don't think it was any of the yearbooks, but I, my mother, after she saw that, pulled out a, a picture of me from, I think, second grade. It must have been second grade because it was the bicentennial year. The, the city hall in Plainfield had an American flag, but it didn't have a state flag. And so I went around with a jar and collected enough money as a kid to buy a state flag to put up at city hall. And, and uh, you know, you hear stories like that. And I think particularly in a state like Iowa, where it's a caucus state as opposed to primary, that's almost like winning a convention vote. Um, you know, a narrative like that, I think, has some impact. You know, what I've got to decide is whether or not to uh, discern what God's calling is in all of this. But it's certainly, you know, to see that kind of response, not only from the folks from Plainfield, but from the young people you, you interviewed in Des Moines at the Young Professionals, it was interesting to hear their feedback. Yeah. Um, when you look back... Yeah, kudos for the, the best, best research story. <laughs> we tried. We got lucky getting into that library, too, by the way. I bet you, because I saw it was dark. I'm thinking, man, you must have got there it was. right before it closed, right? Yep, yep, we did. Um, so one of the other things I wanted to ask you about, sort of related to this, is when you talk about this, the lieutenant governor, have you had conversations with her about about taking over or if you decide a campaign? I mean, do you think she's ready to take over as governor oh, yeah. as she I, needs to? I, I have not had conversations about a presidential run with her in terms of taking over, but but literally the day after the election in 2010, um, we came over, I came over to the transition offices and started sitting down uh, with Dave Schmidtke and the others in the state budget office. And I had Mike Hipsch and Rebecca Clayfish on either side of me. and from just about every budget meeting since, except for a couple when she was in China a few weeks ago uh, on that mission. She was on herself with other uh, officials. She's been at just about every meeting uh, that we've talked about in this budget, just like she has at the last two. She's an integral part of the cabinet. It's why, you know, in fact, somebody noted to me, it's, you know, we gave her some uh, it, a number of the issues we worked on with the Small Business Summit, with tax reform, with other things. We haven't given her kind of throwaway issues, as somebody once said. Uh, we've given her real substantive issues out there. She stepped up to the challenge for somebody who wasn't involved in state government in terms of working there, but who covered it. Um, I think she's she's been right on 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 target and been well well prepared. So the, the last thing I would ask you then is, I mean, you talk about reform mm -hmm. so much about that you're going to have tax reform this year mm -hmm. and education reform. So when you look towards 2015, what do you think is going to be the one thing? The, one, the most impactful reform you'll pursue in 2015? Um, I think entitlement reform. I mean, I think there's a lot of different areas, but for me, I, I want to help transition people from government dependence to true independence, which I think is work. And we've done some of that, but I just think there's so much more we can do. And, and I hear from so many employers who tell me that they have jobs available, but they can't find enough people to take basic level, entry level positions, positions they're even willing to train people for. And it's why a lot of the entitlement reform we're pushing on, we started with employability training. We want to expand that beyond just the food stamps program. And the other discussion I had during the campaign that we're looking to try and do with the drug test, that's not punitive. That's not trying to punish people for their addiction, but rather to say, we need to show that if we're investing in employability training, if we're investing in job skill, if we're trying to get people to move from government dependence to true independence, at least for those who are able-bodied adults without children, we should show that they're ready to be hired. And if employers tell me the two big things are employability skills, basic things. I learned when I was a kid growing up at the countryside restaurant washing dishes in my first job and later flipping burgers at McDonald's. Those aren't common with every worker out there, would-be worker. And the other thing is, uh, employers tell us they need people who are drug-free that can pass a drug test. We, if we can transition people there, um, I, I think it has, it, it's not just a benefit to the taxpayers, it's a benefit to employers who desperately need to fill these positions. And most of all, it's a benefit to those people because I, I just can't believe that the vast majority of people who are dependent on the government today want to be. I don't think most people grow up with their idea being that someday they want to become dependent on the government. I think most people have a bigger dream for themselves and their family than just government dependency. Just to follow up to that, so those the drug testing program mm -hmm. can be has been costly in other states. Mm -hmm. In a tight budget, how do you find the space for that? Well, we think there are ways we can do it that are different than other states. It doesn't add a huge uh, burden in terms of cost in there, and that helps move that transition, provides assistance, because we think if we find people who are addicted, helping us move not only to the test but to the treatment 
quickly gets them the service that they need so they can get back up on their feet again, which avoids some of the higher costs. But we think there's a way to do it. We, I've had our budget teams had a number of different options that we think can dramatically reduce the cost and, and uh, put us in a fairly cost-neutral situation. All right. I think that's it. Great. Then. Great. Thank you.